We're really pleased to have with us two of uh, the nation's leading economists, provocative and important thinkers uh, in economics and history, both of them from Northwestern University. They're good friends who agree and disagree on important points and who've taken their ongoing discussion be between each other to venues like this around the country. We have Robert Gordon at the far left. He is Stanley, Harris, Stanley G. Harris Professor in the Social Sciences and Professor of Economics at Northwestern. His recent work on the rise and fall of American economic growth and the widening of the US income distribution has been widely cited and in uh, 2016 he was named as one of Bloomberg's top most influential people in the world. He is author of The Rise and Fall of American Growth, the U.S. Standard of Living Since the Civil War, published in January 2016 by the Princeton University Press. He is also author of Macro Economics, now in its 12th edition, and The Measurement of Durable Goods, Prices, the American Business Cycle, and the Economics of New Goods. Gordon is a distinguished fellow of the American Economic Association and a fellow of both the Econ Econometric Society and the American Academy of Arts and Science. Sciences. And we have Joel Mokir. He is the Robert H. Strotz Professor of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Economics and History at Northwestern and Sackler Professor by special appointment at the Aitan Berglas School of Economics at the University of Tel Aviv. He, his current research is concerned with the understanding of the economic and intellectual roots of technological progress and the growth of useful knowledge in European societies as well as the impact of industrializa uh, industrialization and economic progress have had on economic welfare. He's been president of the Amer um, uh, Economic History Association, editor-in-chief of the Oxford Encyclopedia of Economic History, and a co-editor of the Journal of Economic History. He, too, is a fellow of the Ec Econometric Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Professor Mokir has authored over 200 articles and books in his field, and like Robert Gordon, his most recent book was published in 2016 by the Princeton University Press, entitled A Culture of Growth, The Origins of the Modern Economy. It explores the critical role of culture in the development of the Industrial Revolution. And so thank you for both for joining us. The, uh, well, the way it's going to work tonight is each of the speakers is going to take about 15 minutes uh, to present their ideas. Then I have some questions for each of them uh, to get some discussion going, and then we'll open it up to the uh, to all of you for some <coughs> questions. And uh, uh, Professor Gordon is going to begin at the podium. Thank you. Delighted to be here in Burlington. Uh, this is not my first trip here. Uh, I first arrived in Burlington in December 1961 on a DC-3 that stopped in Montpelier on its way from Boston uh, to visit my good friend. Uh, Peter Martin, uh, who some of you may know for his uh, uh, ownership of WCAX-TV, uh, local CBS affiliate, which uh, was the last of the independent stations to be sold to a conglomerate uh, just recently, as many of you here know. I'm going to talk about the sources of the slowdown in U.S. economic growth. Economic growth is a great thing and we all want to have more of it. Um, and indeed, as part of his election uh, campaign, President Trump boasted that he would boost economic growth to three or 4% a year from the meager 2% per year that we have experienced in the United States over the eight years since the bottom of the recession in 2009. Now, when you think about that 2%, you have to remember that that 2% growth was made possible by a lot of workers who were previously unemployed. Unemployment was 10% in 2010. It's now 4.1%. So our growth of 2% has only been made possible by all these people being given jobs who were previously unemployed. How fast could our economy grow if the unemployment rate reached bottom? It's almost as low as it could possibly go right now. Now, one way to answer that question is to look at three different periods when the unemployment rate was the same. And I'm going to look at 1970, 2006, and 2016. 
And I'm just going to look at the growth rate of the economy between 2007, 2000, sorry, 1970 and 2006, and 2006 and 2016. And the big drama here is that growth slowed down. Over the first period up to 2006, we grew at 3.2% per year. Uh, given the growth in the population, that's enough for the standard of living more or less to double in a generation. Since 2006, we've grown at only 1.3% a year, uh, falling by more than half. And by definition, growth in our total production in the economy uh, is divided up between output per hour and the growth in hours of work. And the figures there show you that the decline has been equally shared between productivity and the growth in hours of work. We've had a slowdown in the number of hours of work because population growth has slowed, the fertility rate has slowed, the number of people in the labor force as a percentage of the population uh, has gone down. Um, a technique to uh, go beyond just these comparisons of particular periods of time and to say, as a continuous series, how fast can our economy grow? at a constant unemployment rate is shown by this line that goes back to 1950. Uh, and as you can see, we grew at close to 4% in the 1950s and 60s, slowed down to 3% in the 70s and 80s, had a brief revival at the end of the 1990s, and then it's been all downhill since. We've had a catastrophic decline in the ability of our economy to grow at a constant unemployment rate doesn't matter what that unemployment rate is, eventually we're going to reach a rock bottom minimum. Um, and once we get there, this tells us about how fast we'll be able to grow. Productivity shows the same pattern, more of a slowdown in the 70s and 80s, more of a revival in the 1990s, and then this catastrophic falling off. And then making up the third part of that trilogy, output growth, by definition, is equal to growth in output per hour, which we just saw, and growth in hours of work. And here, the growth was actually fast in the 70s and 80s due to the entry of women into the labor force. Uh, but that's over. We now have the baby boom generation that entered the labor force in a big way in the 1970s, accounting for that peak in the middle you see, uh, is now retiring. And in addition, we've had a major drawing back out of the labor force of many prime-aged men and females, males and females, uh, aged 25 to 54, who are neither looking for work nor working, are on Social Security disability. They're, uh, in many cases, simply idle, playing video games, according uh, to some surveys. And so our economy's potential to grow is so much less. Now, slowing productivity growth uh, reflects, in my view, the succession of industrial revolutions. And my point is that the three industrial revolutions we've had so far are not equally important. The first one, uh, on which my colleague Joel Mokir is one of the world's leading experts about why and it happened and when it happened, uh, was the uh, industrial revolution that brought us the steam engine at the end of the 18th century. And that made possible railroads, steam engines, and much manufacturing. In addition, we got uh, mechanical cotton weaving and spinning, and a transition from wood to steel. But the really big industrial revolution, the one that made the most impact on productivity, was the one at the end of the 19th century, and that we call the second industrial revolution. That brought us, above all, electricity and the internal combustion engine. Think of all the things that electricity made possible, and think of the suffering of the people of Puerto Rico now, who have been lacking electricity for months and with months still to come. Uh, internal combustion engines, of course, made possible motor transport and air transport. We got instantaneous com communication with the telegraph, telephone, phonographs, movies, radio, and TV communication and entertainment. An old invention going back to the Romans, running water, finally came to the ur urban household between about 1890 and 1930. Back around 1890, almost no American urban households had bathrooms. By 1930, most of them did. 
and that was uh, an enormous change. Uh, it used to be you had to go out to the outhouse. Uh, it used to be that housewives had to carry pails of water into the house to do their cooking and their cleaning. Uh, chemicals, plastics, antibiotics, all those things were invented at the same time in the late 19th and early 20th century. And there was a complete change in working conditions. Back in 1870, fully half of American men worked on the farm with idleness during the cold months of the year and uh, moved gradually from the unproductive life on the farm to more fruitful activities in the city. So many things could only happen once. We could only once move from a rural to an urban society. Only once could we transfer from striking a match to light a whale or kerosene lamp to electric lights that are all around us here that turn on and off with a switch. Uh, only once could we make the transition in speed from the slow pace of the horse or the sailboat to the fast pace of the Boeing 707 flying close to the speed of sound, and we're not going any faster today. Only once could we go from the alternation of cold in the winter to heat in the summer, thanks to air conditioning and central heating, to an even interior year-round temperature. Only once could we go from horse-drawn communication to the instantaneous news that comes over the radio or the television. Only once could we get bathrooms. We can't go back. And life expectancy, thanks to running water, the curing of waterborne diseases, infectious diseases, grew twice as fast in the first half of the 20th century as in the last half of the 20th century. The third industrial revolution started about 50 years ago, 55 years ago, with the mainframe computer. And it encompasses entertainment, information, and communication technology. Mainframe computers, the transition to personal computers, then the web, then e-commerce. Communications, of course, has morphed from the old payphone where you had to stick in a nickel and then a quarter to the cell phone and then the smartphone. And we've had three major productivity enhancers that completely change our lives every day. The ATM machine that allows us to get cash without going and standing in line at the bank, the barcode scanner that greatly speeds up checking out at retail, and instant credit card authorization. Now, if you ask which of these three industrial revolutions was the most important, part of the verdict comes from looking at the productivity growth statistics. The height of each of these three bars shows you the growth of labor productivity over a period of time. The left-hand bar is the 30 years between 1890 and 1920, the middle bar between 1920 and 1970, and the third bar between 1970 and 2014. And you can see that productivity growth was much faster in the middle period. Now, what accounts for that fast productivity growth? In fact, what accounts for productivity growth in each of the three periods? Well, education, attainment, was greatly enhanced during the 20th century as we transitioned from an economy and a society where only 10% of people had completed high school in 1900 to 1970 when 80% of people had completed high school. So the yellow bar shows the contribution of education, about the same in each of the three periods. The gray bar, or sort of light tan bar, shows the contribution of more machines per worker, what some people call automation, so what some economists call capital deepening. And that's about the same in the three periods, actually a little bit less in the middle period. What's left over, what economists can't explain of productivity growth by machines and by education, is the black bar. Economist jargon for this is called total factor productivity, and it's our best measure of the impact of invention, technology, and innovation. And it also includes other things, like the transition from a rural to an urban society. So as you can see, the impact of this left out factor uh, has been much greater, three times as great, in the middle period, 1920 to 1970, as it was before or after. Looking over the post-war period since about 1950, here's the growth of this total factor productivity, fast in the 50s and 60s, just like 
the productivity line we saw earlier, slower in the 70s and 80s, a very distinct but very temporary revival in the era when the internet arrived, and then very sluggish uh, in the last 10 years or so. And so one of my basic contentions is that the third industrial revolution has failed the test of total factor productivity growth. It's failed it over the long run by only achieving about one third as much total factor productivity growth as in the core middle five decades of the 20th century. And once it did create a revival, it was only for eight years instead of 50 years. And my explanation for this is that as important as the computer revolution was for changing business methods, for changing us from card catalogs to electronic catalogs, from paper ballots to electronic ballots, it just was not as important as the far sweeping a revolution of speed and heat and temperature and rural urban and electricity and everything else that had happened uh, earlier in the 20th century. So when I look out at the economy, with a few exceptions we can talk about later, I see things standing still. I see offices using desktop and laptop computers much as they did 10 or 15 years ago, uh, except for e-commerce, which is still only 10% of retail sales. I still see uh, checking out with humans, humans stocking the shelves, humans slicing meat and cheese behind the deli counter. In construction and home maintenance, oh, is it all the same? It's the same as it was 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, construction is prehistoric. Medicine has advanced uh, with electronic medical records, but doctors and nurses are still there. They're not replaced by robots. They're still doing more or less what they used to. And in the industry that Joel and I represent, higher education, we've had massive cost inflation due to a relentless increase in administrative staff relative to the wonderful instructors that we are in <laughs> instructing our students. So innovation is continuing apace. And how important are these new innovations? 3D printing gets a lot of attention. It's a wonderful new way of making models and prototypes, but it's not mass production. Driverless cars and trucks are surely coming. The first thing that will happen is that we'll get driverless long distance trucks, then we may get driverless taxis. Um, but remember that most truck drivers, at least many of the truck drivers that are driving intra-city, are working for UPS, FedEx, they're dropping off beer and bread and soft drinks at the, at the supermarket, and their job is not only to drive the truck, but to hop off and deliver the goods. And that's not gonna be replaced by driverless cars. Uh, robots have been with us since 1961. Um, by the mid-1990s, they were already uh, everywhere you looked in automobile factories, welding together the bodies, taking over the, plant, uh, the paint factory. Well, how effective are robots? Uh, last week on Saturday, the Wall Street Journal uh, had what you might call the robot expose, uh, revealing the inability of robots to uh, do simple human tasks, uh, the lack of uh, tactile sense in the fingers of the robots, their inability to walk up and down stairs and fall over. Uh, in a competition run by the uh, Defense Department's research agency, robots were brought together, asked to do simple tasks like running a power drill, turning a valve, walking up and down steps. They faltered badly. Things that humans could do in five minutes took 45 minutes for them to do, even with remote controlled assistance. Turning a door tur was daunting for many, if not all, of the robots. And one young observer suggested that if you're worried about the Terminator, just keep your door closed. <laughs> the big action, in my view, is in artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is nothing new. We're not about to have a fourth industrial revolution tomorrow. We've already seen it in airline websites that replace travel agents, in voice recognition that replace transcribers, in language translation that replace translators, in legal searches that have replaced young lawyers and make the legal profession a bad thing for young people to go into. How important is this? A recent survey of 375 corporate executives asked how much revenue had been increased or costs had been reduced by big data and advanced analytics that we call artificial intelligence. And the answer was less than 1% for three quarters of those who responded. Artificial intelligence is here 
and the job displacement. Are we going to run out of jobs? Well, the examples differ. Travel agents have been almost entirely eliminated by airline and hotel reservation systems. Voice recognition and language translation have made a big dent in the people who used to do those jobs. Computer phone menus take you further and further into the conversation without allowing you to talk to a human. And you're all desperate to talk to the human, and the computer keeps preventing you from doing so. Uh, but we still have cashiers, despite barcode scanning. Uh, we still have uh, computerized uh, radiology uh, scans that work alongside radiologists without taking away their jobs. And most spending on artificial intelligence so far is actually in marketing, firms trying to take customers away from each other, not a socially uh, productive uh, uh, activity. Well, here are a couple of good pieces of good news, that machines are not going to take away all the jobs. Here you see from 1980 the uh, rapid advance of ATM machines. Uh, that's shown by the red line that shoots up from zero to 400,000. I know in this screen it's hard to see the vertical axis. But we've gone from zero to 400,000 ATM machines. Has that eliminated the bank teller? No. We started with 200,000 bank tellers. The other faint line that's higher up uh, in 1980, and now we have 400,000 bank tellers. They've not been eliminated. Uh, here again, very faint lines, hard to see. The upper line shows you the employees in e-commerce, how much they've grown since 2008. They've grown by 400,000. Surely they must have eviscerated jobs at bricks and mortar retail stores. Well, yes, in the Great Recession, jobs did fall in brick and mortar retail stores, but they've come back and they've only fallen cumulatively in the last decade by 200,000. And then finally, the best news of all, when spreadsheets were invented with the introduction of the personal computer in the early 1980s, uh, it was predicted that this would be the end of bookkeepers adding up with adding machines the accounts of companies. And yes, indeed, the jobs shown by that dark blue line that slopes down, the jobs of bookkeepers fell from 2 million to 1 million. But the spreadsheet made possible whole new occupations. Financial analysts hardly existed. They've gone from 500,000 to 2 million. So these anecdotes are here to make a purpose. And the last one is the most important. You can predict often who's going to lose their jobs from a technological innovation, in this case, the invention of personal computers and spreadsheets. Yes, the bookkeepers lost their jobs. What you can't imagine, it's hard to conjure up, are the new kinds of employment that are going to be made possible by the new technology, in this case, the financial analyst. So, yes, we're going to lose uh, some jobs from long-distance truck drivers, but who are we to try to project all the new jobs that are going to be created. So to conclude, 70% of all the growth in this total factor of productivity, the economist measure of the impact of innovation, occurred in the central five decades of the 20th century. The big impacts of rising total factor productivity of the third industrial revolution were largely completed by 10 years ago. Innovation continues today many different phases, but it's just not having the impact uh, on productivity that the previous inventions did. And a moderate pace of innovation is good news for all of you, for your children and your grandchildren, worried about whether there will be jobs. A techno-pessimist about productivity is a techno-optimist about the future of jobs. Thank you. I slowed about, showed about 55 slides this afternoon, and so I thought maybe tonight I'll just speak off the top of my head without any slides. Uh, of course, I have the advantage of coming after Bob and not before him. Your mic is not on. Oh, sorry. I'm loud enough, people can hear me. All right, is it better? Yeah. All right. 
So I'm coming after Bob so I can, rather than make this boring and say, oh yeah, well, I, I agree with everything he said, let me sort of very quickly say where I think we agree and then talk at great length about the things we disagree to make this evening more fun. Um, I think he's right about jobs. Um, he's right about jobs, but he's probably right for the wrong reasons. Um, his idea is, oh, well, you know, all these things have, have been invented. They can only be invented once, which, of course, is true by definition. And so, essentially, as I said this afternoon, you know, the sort of low-hanging fruits have been picked, and uh, you know, the rest of it is, is just a mopping up operation. So don't worry about your job. Productivity is growing very slowly, and that's the bad news, but the good news is that that won't eat away uh, your jobs. I actually think he's right, particularly to what he said at the end. A whole bunch of new jobs uh, have been created and will be created, and if you look at past episodes in which we had rapid technological change, very similar things have happened. You know, Bob talked about the first industrial revolution, about which I've written, as he gracefully acknowledged. And um, it's true that, say, by 1825 or so, in the British textile industry, there was a great deal of concern about people who were sort of framework knitters, as they were called, the handloom weavers, who basically saw factories replacing them. And, you know, there were serious concerns and ending up in Luddite riots and even economists writing about this, you know, what's going to happen? Machines will replace these people's jobs. And, of course, they never suspected that even though they themselves might be slowly losing out to the factory, their children, their grandchildren, would have jobs like telegraph operators and, you know, electricians. Uh, that kind of job, of course, wasn't imaginable in 1825, but by 1875, these jobs were very much around. And the same would have been true for somebody in, say, I don't know, 1914, you know, if you told somebody in 1914, well, you know, what kind of work job will your grandchildren do? And if you, and, you, know, you could fly back in the time machine and say, oh, well, they will be cybersecurity experts or <laughs> video game designers. I mean, nobody they would have the foggiest idea what they're talking about. And I think there are jobs in our future which we cannot imagine, uh, but which will be there. That said, um, they will be different. And what I really want to talk about tonight, since I already gave my optimistic view this afternoon and half of you or so are there, I want to talk a little bit about the nature of work. Uh, this is after a humanities conference, and uh, I don't want to talk about total factor productivity, although I, you know, if pressed, I'll, I'll be glad to. But I want to talk about work. Because what often gets shunted aside in these debates about productivity and growth and GDP is the nature of work. And you know, this is, you know, this is in Vermont, you know, when you have a socialist senator. I mean, work is, you know, on everybody's priorities. So, you know, what do we know about the changing nature of work? And let me say a few things about this and then maybe project it into the future and, and, and try to argue that, unlike you know, Bob, I think the best is still to come and life will keep changing at a very rapid rate. So before the Industrial Revolution, you know, trans you know, transport yourself back to the 18th century, actually very few people had jobs. They worked, but they didn't have a job. A job implies a relationship, usually a long-term relationship, not necessarily forever relationship like tenured professors, but uh, <laughs> still a long-term long, a long relationship between an employee and an employer which laid out certain rules, you know? I mean, you work for me, you show up, you know, on, on Monday morning at eight o'clock, you work until whatever, and you get an hour for lunch, and at the end of the week, you get, you get a paycheck, and you, well, you work for me, you don't work for anybody else, and this is all sort of agreed upon. That kind of relationship was very rare, even as late as 1750. I'm not saying it didn't exist. If you dig enough, you, find, you can always find examples in economic history, but basically it didn't exist. What the Industrial Revolution did, it didn't just invent the steam engine or the mule or, you know, uh, the telegraph or gaslighting, it invented the factory. And the factory changed the nature of work radically in ways that had never really been seen before, certainly not at that scale, right? And so Karl Marx is the guy who really put it. You open the first volume of Capital 
And you know, that's what he talks about. He doesn't talk about TFP. He talks about factories and talks, you know, so he doesn't, of course, much like factories. Young people did like them, and we could talk about this in, in an even-handed way. But the nature of the relationship was quite well understood, which is work was to be done in a time and a space dictated by the employer. And the employee was in a situation of basically take it or leave it. You know, you either come and work in our factory, or it doesn't have to be a factory, it could be an office, could be a big department store, but some place of employment, and you work those and those hours, and then you go home. And that's basically the nature of the job. And by, I'd say, on the eve of World War I, I would say something like two-thirds of all people worked that way. Okay, and the rest were, remained like they had been, self-employed, whether they were doctors, lawyers, notaries, or maybe, you know, artisans, you know, watchmakers, shoemakers, people like that, but about a third remained self-employed and everybody else were working in this massive factory system. Of course, as government grows, you know, the government sector becomes part of the factory system. I am willing to predict that that system has peaked. In fact, it peaked maybe 25 years ago and it is slowly starting to decline. That many of our children and our grandchildren will slowly change the nature of work. Now, I'm not totally sure in which direction it will change. You know, we, people talk about the Uberization of the economy. Now, Uber is still, of course, a very small employer. If you toss in, you know, all these other uh, 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 contract work, it's still very small, but it is growing, and I think it will continue to grow. And I would not be surprised if 20, 25 years from now, basically, people like Bob and myself will be also working in some kind of Uber arrangement. And the university calls me up and he says, Joel, you know, would you like to teach a course for economic history? We'll pay you so and so much. You start that in that date, you end at the other date, and then you go home and no further relation. That is the way we're going. Um, how many of us will, even, or how many workers will be eventually uh, be uh, engaged in that kind of uh, relationship, I don't know. But that seems to be very much dependent on the technology at which work takes place. So, you know, two examples. One of them is, of course, this issue of Uber and Lyft. Now, the reason that these companies can exist and similar things like them uh, is because of the, of the technology. That everybody has a smartphone. They have the app, and in fact, the software is, is what makes this kind of relationship possible. Without the software, there is no Uber, there is no Airbnb, there is no, uh, now there's this outfit that sells you people that come, you know, plumbers and, and, and cabinet makers, I mean, all kind of things uh, that you can get if you, if you find the right, the right app. Uh, but it all depends on this technology. The other thing about the factories that technology is slowly making obsolete is in fact the uh, location and the timing of work. So basically today, the vast bulk of people doing any kind of work, whether they're college professors or, or, or Bob's uh, bank tellers, they sit in front of a monitor and they produce some kind of information. Now, it's of course not true for everybody, but it's true for an ever-growing part of the economy. So one of the things that the internet has done is it doesn't make much difference where that monitor is. You, know, you could, it could be at home, it could be in Starbucks, it could be you know, in some vacation. As long as you have good connectivity, you can work anyway. Telecommuting, which was sort of the buzzword 15 years ago, has been growing steadily. Hasn't been growing as fast as some people, including myself, had predicted, but it keeps growing. To some extent, it's a generational issue. I think people of an older generation feel more comfortable uh, perhaps being in the same location. As new generations are growing up, more and more people are demanding that. But the nature, that too is changing the nature of work. I'm not 100% sure, by the way, that that's necessarily a good development. Uh, you know, I mean, there is some value in the, what's known as the water cooler effect. You go to work, you meet people, you interact, and so on. If you sit at home all day, um, you know, in front of a monitor, you may feel sort of feeling lonely, you need human company. Fair enough. And so, what, the answer to that is obviously that telecommuting doesn't preclude you showing up at the office two, three times a week. It's just that you can avoid the rush hour. You know, you show up at 11.30, have lunch with the 
you know, with your colleagues, you know, have a chat, and at 2 o'clock you go home and say, I've got to go back to work and I'm going home before the rush hour. Um, it would save a lot of resources in commuting. It would you know, wear, reduce the wear and tear on our cars. It would, I mean, it's all kind of big advantages. The biggest advantage, of course, is for working parents or people who have to take care of, of people at their home that don't have an 8, an eight to 5 kind of job. I think that's going to be a major change. And uh, it's happening right now. And the speed of it will be determined both by the sort of human social aspects of it and to what extent the technology is, is uh, available. I'm not so naive, of course, to think that we will be entirely disconnected from one another. Uh, but I think the idea of you know, people spending you know, eight hours, five days a week in some office cubicle, and that is the nature of work, that seems to me a, a very extreme kind of outcome. And I think that's basically something that's got to go. Well, will there be jobs? So. Bob was opti op optimistic about it, but a lot of people came to me after my talk and asked you know, whether I was worried about robotization in one form or another. And I must say, and I said this briefly this afternoon, but I want to come back to it, that the world seems to have two kinds of pessimists. Right, okay? There's the Gordon type of pessimist who basically say, oh, well, you know, all these things can be invented only once, and essentially, you know, uh, there's not much that we are going to be, ab be able to add. But there's the other group of, 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 of pessimists, when some of them are more scary, they're saying, no, 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 it's going to be so fast, we will all be redundant. You know, robots, you know, connected to some super-duper uh, uh, cloud-based internet, you know, run by artificial intelligence and neural networks and deep learning and you name it, they will run the world and they will make, uh, you know, people redundant. They will, you know, I mean, this, these are not, you know, some kind of, you know, uh, wild-eyed, a science fiction writer, is somebody like Elon Musk. You know, Elon Musk says, artificial intelligence, he says, is the existential threat to the human race. And you go, Elon, yeah, man, we've got, you know, a, a half-wit juvenile with his finger on the nuclear trigger. You worried about that as an existential, <laughs> uh, existential threat to, uh, uh, to the human race. But, but these are not fools. I mean, this is like Stephen Hawking, okay, the, the premier astrophysicist of the world. In the world, he basically says, look, these things are threatening us to the point where the human race is faced with being, being made extinct by its own creation. And so, well, you know, as I said, they can both be right. Either this is going to sort of slowly peter out and, 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 and be basically going to be 50 years from now, it will be roughly where we are now. Or, you know, we will end up uh, in, the great sing in Kurzweil's great singularity or, or some other sort of horrible, horrible outcome. Um, my sense is that probably neither of them, of these things, are correct. I think what we will see, uh, above all, is not only that the human condition uh, in many dimensions will continue to improve, but that the nature of work will change. And it already, as I said, it already, already has changed. And it has changed in one more dimension that perhaps maybe I should bring up, and that is we work less than we used to. The average working hour at the beginning of the 20th century in most industrialized nations was about 2,900 hours a year. So you can do the math, but that's, you know, that's very few vacations, and that's close to a 60-hour uh, work week, uh, a work hour a week. So that's, these are long days, long weeks, long years. Um, today, in the United States, it's about 1,850 hours. In most European countries, it's about 1,500 hours. So they have longer vacations, they have more maternity leaves, earlier retirement, and so on and so forth. People work less. I know it doesn't feel like it. Uh, doesn't feel like it to me, too. But there's a reason for that. We all work harder and more hours, not because we have to, but because we want to. And that, I think, is one of the things that we really need to recognize if we're going to think about what technology is doing to work. And that is, it is slowly but certainly blurring the boundary between work and leisure. It's not just 
true for college professors for whom this has always been true. But it is true for lots and lots and lots of people. They take their iPhone and their computer with them and they go on vacation and the first thing they do in the morning is they check their email, they write the, you know, messages to people. I mean, they do work. The, the sharp lines between leisure and work that the Industrial Revolution drew are slowly disappearing. They're disappearing for more and more people. Uh, and that, I think, is precisely what this, how this is changing uh, society. I, you know, you really wish Marx could have seen this because it would really, I think, if this, this more than anything else shows you know, how capitalism can actually cope with what technology throws on it by changing the parameters of production in a much more sort of radical way than he could ever have imagined. I'm not blaming him for this, but this is clearly uh, what has been happening. And then, you know, leisure, it's sort of an interesting thing. I mean, imagine, so I don't know how many of you remember, the, it's a novel by Kurt Vonnegut called Player Piano. This is in humanity's audience. So many of you may have read A Player Piano describes this sort of dystopia in which nobody works, okay? And people living these sort of vapid, empty, uh, meaningless lives, and it's all run by robots and machines, and you know, as Vonnegut could imagine it. Now, I think that is a very ahistorical view. We always, ladies and gentlemen, had a leisure class. History, I can't think of a single episode in which history doesn't have a leisure class. There are people who didn't work. They were landowners, aristocracy. In some cases, they were priests. They may have been military leaders, and so on and so forth. But if you read the history of the leisure class, and by God, there's a bit literature about it, you actually very see very few examples of people who say, gee, you know, I really feel my life is empty. I think I'm going to grab a shovel and spend eight hours in the blazing sun, you know, digging up fields. Doesn't happen. Uh, and there's a good reason why it doesn't happen, okay? Because obviously people find ways of filling their leisure time, and it's not just playing video games. It is basically doing whatever they choose to do. So we have far, far, far more leisure than any generation that lived uh, before us. And in a way, we are, I think, on the road of shedding what John Maynard Keynes once called the Adamite curse. But the Adamite curse is, of course, for those of you who remember your, your Bible, when Adam and Eve are thrown out of, out, of, out of paradise, God says to them, in the sweat of thy brows I shall eat bread. Right? You all remember that. That's the curse we are now getting rid of. We will be able to move, maybe not in this generation, maybe we'll take another generation or two, we will be able to move to a world in which the vast bulk of people who work will work because they want to work, not because they have to work. And in fact, of course, that is already happening. Something like 25% of all Americans actually are engaged in volunteer work. They work, but they're not being paid for it. They do it because they like it, not because they need the money. This is not just true for retired people. It's true for people in jobs. It's true for people even, you know, for people in high school. It's true. They, they do things because they want to do it. So if it were to pass that many human jobs would be taken over by machines, and I don't share Bob's uh, pessimism about robots, I think... <laughs> Uh, we are with robots today where the steam engine was approximately in, say, 1760. So you could walk around in England in 1760, look around and say, ah, these steam engines, they're not going to amount to anything. All they do is pump water out of mines, they make a terrible noise, they use a lot of coal, but they'll never get any, go anywhere. Well, if you said that in 1760, you would have been wrong, because clearly these things were getting better. Robotics, combined with AI, are going to replace workers. It's not as fast as some people thought, and it will not go to all the jobs, but eventually it will take place. I went to an AI conference in Toronto a couple of weeks ago where a bunch of people showed us what AI can do, not compared to, 2000, to, compared to 2013, and how they slowly can do things like beat every doctor in reading MRI output, you know. Uh, now, for a while, you can see that there are sort of two curves. Here's how the doctors do it, and here's how the MRI does it. And with three, four years from now, basically they beat it in reading MRI results, X-ray results, all kind of, of diagnostic tests that 
can do, be done better by machines now than it could before. Is that going to throw the doctors out of work? I think not. I think the, change, the, the job of the doctor will change just as Bob's bank tellers have changed. But I can imagine that people will then work less, that the work will be less boring because all the boring routine things will be done by machines and the sort of fun parts will be left for people. I don't think anybody could find flaw with that kind of argument. And, you know, and then by and large, if we go from you know, a working year of 1,500 hours to one of 1,200 hours or 1,000 hours, nobody are complained. Americans are still getting very few vacation days. We are still extremely skimpy with maternity, paternity, family leaves. Uh, there's a whole bu a bunch of margins in which we could have people work less and still presumably make a living. And that takes me to my sort of last question. And I wanna, that's something I want to throw out because I don't know the answer, but we all need to think about that. Um, I think we, most economists, certainly the ones that were at that AI conference, agree that within a foreseeable time, whether it's a decade or a generation, a large number of people will be replaced by machines of one form or another. And that it's still an open question how many of them will be able to maintain some kind of work and how many of them will be made redundant. And so the real issue, of course, is what do we do with people who have been replaced by machines? Okay? If truck drivers are going to be replaced by self-driving trucks, and I think Bob's example of, well, but it's not all truck drivers do, they, can all, they also have to schlep these bottles and put them in the back of the store. But you know, those jobs are, are easily automated by new machinery. Within 10 years, that's exactly going to be happening. Whether it will be actually done by, by some robot doing it, some kind of clunky machine that, that, that I think it's probably more likely there will be some com combination of a drone uh, and some, some other clever device that we can't even imagine, but it will happen. But what do we do with the people who have been made Redundant. How are these people going to make a living? So there is a growing literature about saying, look, in a society in which we have the capability of producing vast amount of riches without people putting in a lot of work, how are, we, how are the people going to earn money? And the answer is quite simple. It depends on who owns the robots. If the robots are going to be owned by the top 0.1%, then basically they are going to be the ones that can control the resources of the wealth of society, and the rest of the population, or a large chunk of the rest of the population, will be dependent on their generosity, and I would not uh, really count on that. But we, have, but we have an example, and I'll stop with that. Technology is going to do miracles. And the miracles can be seen as some kind of a windfall. Now, we have examples of windfalls happening in the last generation or so in the form of natural resources. And so we have countries in which there is a huge amount of wealth created by using natural resources. Places like, the example that comes to mind is Norway and Canada, where those resources are being used in an more or less judicious way, and the wealth is being spread around. In fact, even Alaska had some of that because they were, of course, sending these negative state income tax checks to everybody as, lo as long as the oil revenues were coming in. So, we, so every society has the choice. They can become like Canada or Norway, or they bec can become like Nigeria or Russia, or you name your, your, your little kleptocratic country in which vast amounts of resources are being produced and basically stolen by a small, greedy uh, elite of you know, bandits and, and, and uh, predators who take it all for themselves and leave the rest population in poverty. In my sense, that's the model we should think of. And if, you know, if, if the United States, which is still the technological leader of the world, is going to get this kind of windfall in the form of technology rather than for resources, we can make that choice. We can become like Norway or we can become like Nigeria. It's something that's going to be decided by the next generation. Thank you very much.
Thank you to both of you. Is this working? Can you hear me? Um, I would like to ask each of you to uh, respond to a thought I had listening to Joel. Um, when you were talking about uh, how more and more our people are working more because they're choosing to, and um, it sounded like a kind of golden age. And I am one, I, my understanding of the state of the US economy is a lot of people are working two and three jobs because they have to and they're just trying to hold on. And, um, and uh, with growing inequality is this kind of golden age of uh, new jobs uh, for everybody likely to happen or, um, uh, or are we uh, sort of on the other side of Robert Gordon's um, um, growth graph? Robert? Now I'll be able to take twice as long as him in answering since he took twice as long as I did. Yeah. <laughs> Is that true? We, what we've had in the last 25 years is what is called the polarization of the labor market. So that both of your uh, predictions are correct. At the top with college educated people, not every college educated job, but a great number of them uh, involve people. They continue to do work when they get at home. They're uh, engaged in what they're doing. And at the same time, there are people with high school or less education who are just uh, going through the paces of doing work to make money. And as you say, many we have 5 million people in the United States who are working part-time who want full-time jobs and can't get them. And so they're doing a string of part-time jobs, making it so difficult to arrange for childcare and to bring up a family and to have an organized life. Uh, so it's the bifurcation between the good jobs and the bad jobs uh, that's the real problem. Um, I completely disagree that we're going uh, into a world in which we're going to have uh, more and more leisure. Uh, the uh, work week, as Joel said, was 60 hours a week at the turn of the 20th century. It went down to 40 hours a week by 1950, and it's been in the range of 35 to 40 hours a week uh, ever since. We have not seen any uh, apparent desire by society as a whole to reduce work hours to the 15 hours a week that John Maynard Keynes uh, predicted in his uh, letters to his grandchildren, a famous essay. Uh, so uh, I think you have to be very careful in predicting a future of leisure or a a future of contract work with the employment relationship declining as, as you did. And remember that so many people today uh, are working in jobs just to make money, manual jobs, often two or three a week, patched together. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not denying that there are a lot of people today who are still struggling, keeping two or three jobs, and so on. And Bob is I think quite right. There has been some kind of a bifurcation of the labor force, in which on the one hand you have people, you know, college-educated, white-collar jobs, and on the other hand you have people, you know, struggling to make uh, the ends meet. You know, flipping burgers at McDonald's and, uh, during day, and then being salesperson at Walmart in the, in the evening. And that's all happening. But the nature of work has still changed, and that's I think something that's easily glossed over. Work in the past, and you really need economic stories to, to tell you that work in the past was primarily physical work. I mean, for one thing, most people worked in agriculture, but it was an unmechanized agriculture. You know, you really work with a shovel and a hoe and a spade, and even the, the, the plow that, that your horse pulled, it took a lot of muscle power. So people worked. The same as with manufacturing. The work was physical. And even when the first steam engines came around, I mean, you go and see what people did. This was tough physical work. And today, the people who have two or three jobs work long hours to make, to make ends meet, and the minimum wage that they're being paid is scandalous. But the physicality of the work 
has been reduced enormously because of mechanization. And that's something that you really need, so you go, go, go see what work was like. The same is true, and Bob actually describes this beautifully in his book, the same was true for housework. And um, he, uh, he cites Ruth Cowan, if I recall correctly, who describes what it was like to do laundry in the 18th and 19th century compared to what it is today. But it isn't just laundry, it's dishes, it's vacuuming, it's cleaning, it's everywhere. You know, we work, but the nature of the work has been made much less physical. One consequence of that is that our bodies aren't worn out as, as, as quickly as they used to be. And what that means is, yes, we may not be at the 15 hours uh, at, uh, a week that John K K Maynard Keynes hoped for. But we do, and even people in low-end jobs can do this, we, we do have golden years in which there's such a thing as retirement. Bob and I aren't part of this, aren't yet part of this story, but <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of our cohort mates are. And in, certainly, if you look at the Western world as a whole, the average rate, rate of retirement is still somewhere around 62. Now, if people who are 62 can expect to live to 83. So 21 years of leisure are tacked on to a life of work. Now, that, in the 19th century, would have been unthinkable. Retirement barely existed outside a few very, but basically, once you stop working within a year or two, you know, the median person was dead. Then these golden years in which you spent on the golf course, going to museums, you know, enjoying yourself. And, you know, you go to any museum today, anywhere in the world, and just these groups of, of pensioners, you know, uh, uh, have, a, have a wonderful. I mean, I keep seeing this. They're, they're, it's annoying in a museum because they sort of push you aside from the picture. But, 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 but I'm thinking, you know, the hell would you see this in 1850? And these people just wouldn't be alive, or if they were alive, they'd be out there working. That kind of leisure has been made possible in our modern society. In my senses, we're going to go way beyond that. And that, uh, okay, uh, here, I find that hopeful. Okay. Now, I want to thank my colleague, Joel Mokir, for so dramatically making my point <laughs> about how horrible work was at the end of 19th century for males in the factory and in agriculture, and how excruciating it was for the housewife at home, carrying the pails of water, working on the scrub board, and carrying the dirty pails of water out. That kind of life was completely common at the end of the 19th century. It was basically eliminated by the 1950s. We had a one-time only transition to a much more pleasant kind of life, made possible even further by the invention of air conditioning. We have not had anything like the change in the character of daily life or daily work in the last 50 years that we did in the 100 years before that. I hold and I here, think you, I hold you have here made the counterexample. <laughs> this is a machine that does 50 of the functions just job this job this Oh, it, describe them better, it does faster, the laundry and, and the complex. dishes, huh? <laughs> it, it, it is, you know. He's prone to exaggeration, folks. Um, I, so this was a cheap rhetorical trick. No, he does his dishes by rubbing his smartphone on the dishes. I, w I wonder if... Um, Clue I, me enough, I will. I wonder if uh, this is partly a question of how we measure human welfare. I mean, we can, we can um, talk about economic productivity and factory output and this and that, um, but uh, uh, Joel is talking about uh, um, uh, information at his fingertip, and that may not be measurable in the same way, but it might be uh, really important or just as important. Uh, what do you think? All right, you know, here is where I think you, you're actually touching on an excellent point. Because not only that I have that information, the staggering thing is it's basically free. And, um, you know, that, that, that's, really, that's really staggering. I mean, the way we, have, we can access the knowledge of the entire world by pushing a button at instantaneously and having that available to us is mind-boggling. But it's even more mind-boggling. It's free. I mean, you go into a Google, you do a Google search, and you know, we can talk about the pluses and minuses of a Google search, but basically, this is free. You feel like listening to a Mozart quartet on your headphones. I push Spotify, 
and I have a Mozart quartet, and I even can choose if we want the one quartet and five different performances, okay? It's free. If it's free, it doesn't enter the national income accounts because you multiply anything by zero, it's still zero, and therefore it doesn't enter Bob's total factor productivity uh, uh, calculations. Now you keep adding all the things that are free, and you say, gee, you know, maybe we're missing something in these growth calculations. Uh, the smartphone and before it, the internet available on the laptop, which was, or the desktop, which was the first way we communicated with Google, uh, indeed have brought us uh, free information that's not counted as GDP. And that is a creation of what economists call consumer surplus uh, that is added to our well-being uh, beyond what the official government statistics uh, say. But the addition of consumer surplus, such as free information, is not new. The turn of the 20th century brought with it a drop in infant mortality from 20% of babies dying in the first year to only 1% dying in the first year. It brought a removal of uh, horse manure from the streets. It brought a whole new range of activities where the freedom to explore was made possible by a Model T Ford that in 1923 only cost $265. All of those creations of consumer surplus in the first part of the 20th century were not part of GDP either. So yes, of course, the smartphone and the provision of free information is giving us benefits that are not measured. But we have received many, many such benefits in the past. And so the, the question is, is the degree of mismeasurement today more or less important uh, than it was in the past? Uh, I would certainly agree that the rate at which we're becoming better off is understated by government statistics, but it has always been understated, at least going back uh, to the middle of the 19th century. For centuries before then, the rate of improvement was very slow, and Joel is an expert historian but, on when those changes took place. Oh yeah. But the issue is, and I think here Bob, Bob is of course absolutely right again, and I, we, we agree on, on, the, on the essence, but there's details that matter. We are, have always understated the rate of economic growth because we have not taken into account not only the fact that there are lots of products that are unpaid for, but perhaps equally, equally important, more important, is quality improvement. So the same good that you bought last year cost the same, but it is now slightly better in some way. Now, if that way is measurable, in principle, the Bureau of Labor Statistics can correct for that, but many ways, it, you know, it's just very, just really difficult uh, to measure the improvement. And when I came to this country in 1970 and we bought our first color television, I still remember, you know, flipping through the channels and you know, there's people playing football on a, on a on football uh, grass that was sort of bluish gray, and the sky was sort of yellow, and you know, <laughs> the, 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 the colors were just absolutely dreadful. And in Europe, they were they already been, they, they were better. In the United States, it was. Like, and now you, you, know, you look at the quality of a flat screen television with the ultra super duper high definition or whatever it's called today. You know, the picture is crystal clear. I mean, it's the, the quality improvement is just vast. The sound is better. The choice is better. The variety is better. I mean, there are hundreds of dimensions in which that particular aspect of, of, of a product has been improved. We are not all taking that into account. And the question is, is the rate of improvement today faster than it was in the 1930s and 1940s. And I think it is. And I think it is because we, A, we see it all around us, but there's something even more important, and that is a lot of these things have uh, very, you know, they are expensive to develop, but once they exist, okay, they're actually fairly cheap to give out, and so the price tends to be go down to the, extra, to the extra cost. And I think that is, we have far more of that in large part because digital technology has that particular characteristic of very high upfront cost or fixed cost as we call them in economics and very low uh, um, a, a cost for each additional unit. Okay? And that I think is true for a lot of these things. It's very expensive to maintain something like Wikipedia, right? I mean, well, not very expensive, but it costs something. But the addition of one more consumer is essentially zero. And that's what drives, that's why the only price feasible is actually zero. And that happens 
over and over and over again. And as the digital component of our GDP is growing, more and more things are going to be uh, follow, following that nature. There's one more thing I want to point out, and then Bob can jump all over me. There are things... Just wait. <laughs> there are things that are not designed to be measured by our GDP statistics. I mean, at least in principle, quality improvement, we should, but we don't. But there are things that, that aren't. And, and then let me point out you know, something out. It's totally obvious once you think about it. Suppose you're, gonna, you're going to a store and buy something. And so, well, you know, so they, what, the, what the statistics register is I went to a pair of a, a shoe store and I bought a pair of, of sneakers for $29.99. And then, you know, the transaction says so and so bought a pair, and that's, that's what enters the GDP statistics. Now, the, the cost to me, of course, is higher than that because I have to drive to the shopping center. I am using gasoline, I'm using time, then I have to park my car, I waste more time looking for the right pair of, pair of shoes, I stand in line in front of the lady writing a check, and you know, it goes on and on and on. And then I go home, I have a pair of shoes, but the only cost that's registered is the $29.95 that I paid for the shoes, not the time, not anything like that. Now what modern technology has made it possible, and this has been happening in the last 10 or 15 years uh, increasingly, is it's basically cut all the costs except the $29.95. I sit at home, I turn on my computer, I go into Amazon.com, I see a whole bunch of, I push a button, and two days later there's a pair of shoes, the exact size I want, in front of my, in front of my door. So there has been a gain in productivity because all these other costs no longer exist. The national income statistics you know, don't register because they're not interested. Um, and this happens in literally dozens and dozens and dozens of instances. And once we start figuring out that way, uh, one conclusion is, you know, these statistics that Bob showed you uh, are really designed for an economy that produces steel and wheat and tires and things like that. It is, they're not designed for an economy in which the informational content of products is high and getting higher. And what we really need is we need to completely rejigger the way we calculate output and productivity. That, I think, is a challenge for the next generation of economists. I think we'd like to open this up to the audience now. So you get the shoes, they don't fit properly, you send them back. Or the color is not quite what, what you thought they'd be. And besides that, the internet's not free. Everybody in this room pays a monthly fee for it. And then your hardware lasts about three years and needs to be replaced. That, that's an anecdote. I don't think that... Um, we need to respond to that. Uh, but I do want to point out two things about Joel's recent, uh, most recent comment. Um, these wonderful decreases in cost and improvements in quality in televisions, in internet-related uh, services, to put that in perspective, the share, the percent of our total economy devoted to television hardware audio, stereo, internet hardware, internet services, phone services, all of those things added up are only 7% of our GDP. Yeah. There is a lot of our GDP yeah. where there's no improvement going on at all, and I'll name the construction industry as example number one, and I'll put higher education perhaps as, as uh, example number two. Uh, so, and the other thing uh, about e-commerce and its 29.95 uh, sneakers, yes, that is absolutely true that there is wonderful consumer surplus made possible by e-commerce. Again, though, to put it in perspective, in the last recorded year, e-commerce was 8% of retail sales. So the bricks and mortar stores have not gone away. From Joel's account, they're going to go away pretty fast if everyone they is They are Joel. going great. If you talk to the people at Kmart and you get an idea how bad things That's are. Good. Let me just make one more comment, okay? But I'll stay here after nine because I'm... But, and uh, 17% of our GDP goes to medical care, which is not, you know, a small sector. The improvements in the quality of medical care, whether, you know, much as we quitch, quitch about our medical care, the improvements in a host, both diagnostic and treatment, in cancer treatment, in joint treatment, in the treatment of Parkinson's, you know, you, you name it, have been improving at a dazzling rate over the last 10 years, okay? That's a large proportion the of our GDP. The last 50 years, the last 100 years. But it, Bob, it has, 
I hate to tell you, break the news to you, it has accelerated a great deal over the last 15 years. I will just, you know, take, take a look at the total statistics about qualies and about how people with new joints, with better hearing aids, better uh, uh, cataract surgery, uh, better pacemakers, you name it, people in their 80s and in their 90s who used to be wearing a wheelchair, 25 years ago, they're out there hopping around on the golf course. Let's, let's give the audience a chance. <laughs> Hi, thanks. That was riveting. I especially like the dynamic between the two of you. You have a good road show. Um, I, uh, I'm really interested in this um, percentage of 20 to 50-year-olds who don't work and possibly, arguably, play video games or uh, are lazy. Um, I just want to interrogate for one second video games because they're obviously an, an effluvia of the digital revolution and part of this third industrial revolution you're talking about. Video games, I play a fair number myself, massively multiplayer online role-playing games, use money in them, they have the conceit of work, they have the conceit of productivity, they've even gone so far as Steve Bannon, I think, made some money uh, uh, it, it, having Chinese workers mine gold in the game of World of Warcraft for American players who were too lazy to mine the gold in the game themselves, <laughs> right? So that sounds absurd, but it is only four steps away from, it's two steps from day trading and four steps from Bitcoin. So people who play video games, everything from online poker to these MMPORG games, um, often see themselves as, on, as on, on steps toward making money. You can go all the way to thinking that you're selling stuff on eBay or Etsy as part of your video game, or you're promoting your work on Facebook or Twitter as part of your video game. So I wonder what to do with that time. We, you it, uh, described it as practically lost time entirely, that it's like laziness and video games go back and forth, but maybe this is the marbled work leisure that you described that reads as leisure time, doesn't code in the GDP, and yet deserves some consideration. I, th I would put this in the same category as the improvement which Joel so dramatically uh, described in the quality of television that is available as a leisure time activity. Go back before his arrival in 1970. I remember in 1949, our first television set was a pumpkin-shaped black and white television set that was 13 inches and was black and white and had a fine tuning knob that you had to continually twist in order to get the picture to be sharp. And of course, today we've got 75 inch uh, TV sets with ultra high uh, definition. That is a vast improvement in the quality of one hour spent looking at, at television. You're suggesting there has been an improvement in one hour spent playing video games since the crude video games of 20 years ago. Um, and I think it all fits in the same category of unmeasured quality change in services. I, I guess, and I, I don't want to take up too much time, but I guess uh, a lot of gamers see themselves, and, and I mean especially those who get into cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, see themselves as making digital artifacts, as producing digital artifacts exactly. that end up being money, yeah. Bitcoin. But this is, is an interesting, there's an interesting a, a academic pa paper that very much nicely illustrates your work. There is a, a team of economists led by a guy called Eric Hurst at the University of Chicago. You can Google it. And they ask the same question that Bob has asked the other people, which is, why the hell do we have people in their, males in their prime age, between age 10, uh, age 20 and 30, you know, have lower labor force participation rates? Uh, because it, that's, there, there's no, they can get jobs. I mean, the employment rate is 4.7 percent. You know, there, there are jobs. They look people, employers, they were looking for these people don't want to work. Well, what do they do? And the answer he gave is exactly the answer. They're sitting there. They're not playing, you know, Pac-Man or you know, little things. They are immersed in 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 major activities that involve many players, and they're reenacting entire, creating entire worlds. I mean. There's an ev there are evolutionary processes. There are nations go to war. There. I mean, there's a whole world, that there, a, a virtual world that's being created. And uh, if you think video games are attractive, now wait for the next generation of virtual reality. And you know, it's going to be blowing where everybody's mind. I mean, I, you know, that is, I mean, in a way, that's a concern in some sense because this stuff is highly addictive, very tempting. 
and, and people get, get immersed in it, and they, they do this still seven hours a day, 12, seven days a week, 12 hours a day. And, and don't, and don't it's, forget, it's if I can connect this with a major social problem, uh, today, 58% of American college graduates are female, 42% are male. We have a major problem with the development of young boys in this society, and part of the problem is their addiction to video games and their lack of ability to concentrate on their schoolwork. Well, they're concentrating on the video games, you know? Mm -hmm. That's One helpful. final question in back. I have a question about uh, globalization. Um, it, it seems to me there's probably hundreds of millions of people who are still working more than 3,000 hours a year. Um, and with technolo technological change, um, there should be, in, in the future years, a tremendous growth in productivity. Um, what are the implications for the Western world of, of that change coming uh, in the future? And I think of the fact that just about everything I purchase now is made in China. The, uh, a quick answer is that uh, free trade, which is endorsed by most economists, uh, brings the consumer the cheaper goods that you refer to that, you, that are made in China, uh, provide jobs for exporting industries like uh, Boeing workers who make uh, 777 aircraft that are flown by Air China and China Southern Airlines. Um, and those gainers from trade, the consumers and the workers in the export industries, uh, more than offset the losses to the people who lose their jobs in the import competing industries. And the story told in the economics classroom is that society gains enough from free trade to be able to take some of those gains and help the losers by retraining subsidies for moving and relocation and other kinds of uh, help for those who lose from the process. What our country is not doing is sufficient help for those who are the losers. Yeah. I, 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 I'll say amen to that, but, I, but I, I'm quite with you. I'm not so much worried about mechanization eliminating jobs in the United States. And in fact, I'm not that worried about eliminating jobs in China because China actually is experiencing labor scarcities and the wage rates have there been going up. It isn't China that's the concern. My concern is with places like Indonesia, Bangladesh, Thailand, Pakistan, uh, uh, many African nations now. That's where the really, really cheap, poorly paid workers are. And with mechanization, for these people, this could really spell doom. And that's something I actually lose sleep over because I'm not totally sure that that is a consequence in which our, which our uh, people have even thought about. In fact, certainly not, certainly not the current administration. We have time for one more question. Since this is a humanities thing, I just want to distinguish that as good as this conversation has been that, that economic good is not necessarily human well-being as a, because we have a social and cultural fabric that I think is unweaving. I want to pose the challenge that I think Joel, I, I see his vision coming uh, to fruition, but that, that idea of we're going to give back, it, we have, I feel, and maybe there's others feel the same, a rise in corruption. We're going the other direction of consolidation of wealth. So how are we, how can, how can we expect this to play out to benefit everyone when, when it seems the trajectory of wealth and power is going to fewer and fewer people? Let me give you a quick answer to the concentration of wealth. In the last 20 years, 50% of all the income gains went to the top 1%. What's wrong with our economy that it creates such enormous gaps between the top 1% and the bottom? The problem at the top is that the free market awards enormous salaries to football players, sports stars, celebrities, chief executive officers, uh, and the top people in every field. And I don't think it's the job of the government to try to interfere with that process. What the government can do is to have a surtax, an extra higher tax bracket for people making above a million, above 10 million, above 25 million. And have a more progressive tax system to try to balance at the top end. 
The problem at the bottom end is the decline of labor unions, which is a much more serious problem in the United States than it is in many European countries, the decline in the real minimum wage, and all of those things are political. Uh, our country has gone in the direction of state right to work laws instead of encouraging unions. Many of the problems that you describe are not such uh, problems to the same degree in Germany, in France, in Scandinavia. And the right question to ask is, what do they know that we have forgotten? Yeah. No, I, I, I totally agree. I, I could add to that, but maybe we should have one. If we can have one more That's question. It. Okay, fine. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Robert Gordon and Joel here.